Okay, so I guess I will, we will get started. Um, hoping for a few more students than this, but I guess it's cold and rainy, so it's all, you, all, all we can expect. Um, you got one more. Oh, cool. <laughs> cool. And she's a veteran. Awesome. We rely on you guys more than the students. Um, so I'm Taro Denger. I'm the president of Young Americans for Freedom here at Michigan Tech for this semester. Um, thank you, I, th I thank you all for coming either to speak here or to listen to the event. This is our final event of our Freedom Week, so a really nice way to wrap things up and um, celebrate Veterans Day, which is actually tomorrow, but it's nice that that coincides with Freedom Week and all of our events. Um, I would like to thank our four veteran speakers for coming to speak here for us tonight. Um, Joshua King, um, Maria Kinnanen, Joseph Enrietti, and Walter Casey. Correct. Um, I appreciate you guys coming. And so this will be a very enlightening event, and I'm really excited about it and looking forward to what all you guys have to say. So Joshua, I would like to invite you to come and speak first. Hi, I'm uh, Joshua King. Um, I'm a Navy veteran. I'm also a 30-year uh, material science and engineering student here. Um, and I served uh, as a submarine and machinist mate for six years active duty. And then for um, three and a half or so years, almost four years, I served uh, as an areographer's mate in the um, Navy Reserves. Uh, areographer's mate, for those who don't know, is a weather person. Because um, I didn't know when they told me that's what I was going to be. So, um, a couple common questions I get asked about being on submarines is first, are there any windows? And no, there aren't any windows on submarines. Um, more often than not, we're too deep for there to be any sort of uh, uh, light anyway. Um, another common question I get asked is how deep do submarines go? And I can't say. Um, but I was back in the engine room, so for me, it didn't really matter that much. Um, I didn't get to see where the ship was going or anything like that. Um, another question I get asked a lot is, is it claustrophobic? And um, I would say if you're flying on an airplane, you're probably fine on a submarine. Um, there's actually a lot more room on the submarine than, than on most airplanes these days. Um, so uh, uh, why I decided to join the Navy is um, when I first got out of high school, I sort of had a bit of purposelessness in my life. Um, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do and I um, uh, I tried college a little bit, but I, I struggled along the way, just sort of not necessarily knowing what um, what I wanted to do. It's kind of a, a big question to ask a lot of people. Um, and I was one of those people that I guess was kind of annoying and didn't have to try it all in high school, and so college was a bit of a, a rude awakening of sorts. Um, and then I sort of was following in the footsteps of an uncle who told me that he did a great job, uh, that the Navy did a lot for him. Um, but specifically why I ended up deciding the Navy as opposed to any of the other branches was I went into a recruiter's office where there were, uh, all the branches were there, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Army. And when I walked in the door, um, the Army and Marines recruiters were yelling at each other about stealing each other's recruits. And the Navy guy was just sitting in the back laughing. And I was like, that guy seems like my speed, so I'll stick with him. Um, so once I joined, I ended up going to, to Navy Nuclear School, which is pretty tough. Um, I think it's considered one of the toughest programs in, in the military. Um, it's a little bit ironic that I didn't do so well in college, so I decided to become a nuke because uh, the nuke school is basically um, college, but with none of the fun stuff and a lot of extra military stuff stacked on top. So, you know, instead of 15 hours a week, it was more like uh, 50 hours a week. And then, um, you know, adding the formations and PTs on top of that. Um, but the last little section that you do, so that's about a year and a half, and the last six months you get to practice on a prototype reactor. And uh, that's, that's uh, pretty nice. The one thing that is big, uh, a big difference that I find between here, and, uh, a college program and the nuclear program, is that you're constantly working towards a, a uh, goal. So instead of where, you know, I don't know the students that are here, what sort of programs you're in, but as far as like a heat transfer class, instead of you know, sort of a theoretical work in, work out, or heat in, heat out. We know exactly what our heat in is going to be. That's our, uh, our steam generator. 
we know exactly what our workout is going to be, our turbines, and we know exactly what is going to cause those things to change. So we know that the seawater temperature, that's what's going to change our heat out and all of that sort of stuff. So there's a much more um, focused approach as far as what you're learning. It's a lot less theoretical and a lot more hands-on. Um, so I think that's part of the reason I did well. That and um, doing poorly comes with a lot of extra punishment that uh, <laughs> civilian life does not. Um, once I got out to sea, um, I liked it a whole lot. I was stationed in Hawaii, which was absolutely terrible. Um, uh, I got to do a lot of hiking, but you know, as anybody who was on board boats know, we were out to sea a lot. I didn't get to spend too much time um, exploring the island. It's not as much as I would like to. Um, out on the submarines is pretty great, um, but it does come with the good and the bad. Uh, naturally, with the I only remember the good looking back in hindsight. So all of those frustrations that got me down was, uh, you know, they're sort of in the past now. Um, but there are some interesting things that you get to do on submarines that you don't get to do elsewhere. We do angles and dangles, which is Basically, the, whoever's driving the boat when we first go out tries their best to throw anything that might not be tied down loose so we know what's loose. And uh, it's kind of fun to challenge yourself to see if you can't stay standing while they're tilting all over the place. Um, another interesting thing I didn't know before going on submarines um, is once you're out to sea, um, older submarines, diesel submarines, are set up so that they are, um, you know, they'll stay on the surface and then when they have reason to go down, they'll go down and they'll stay down for maybe about a day or two, I, I don't know the exact length, but they'll come up and they'll spend a lot of their time on the surface. Um, not so with modern submarines. Um, so the older submarines are designed to be on the surface, right, with the sort of classic V-shape in the front. Uh, modern submarines, the nuclear-powered ones, are, are circular. I say all that to say that um, the waves toss them around a lot more than any other vessel, and even the people with the strongest stomachs um, end up getting seasick. I remember one day I was uh, coming back to my rack after we had just started up the reactor and uh, I had stood my first watch and I was exhausted. I was coming back to my rack and literally all of my stuff out of my rack was gone. The rack curtain was gone. All of my bedding was gone. And it turns out somebody had almost made it to the bathroom but not quite and I happened to be in the splash zone. So they <laughs> tore all my stuff down and were washing it. Um, but let's see. Um, oh, and then I did get to do, as far as I'm aware, this is starting to, um, be phased out, at least I hope so, but I got to enjoy hot racking. For those of you that don't know, that is uh, two beds and three people. So you, uh, a lot of times you crawl in a bed that's still warm from the previous person, which is, uh, you know, it's not great. And I feel bad for my rack mates because I was back in the engine room. I dealt with the, um, my job mostly dealt with the steam systems and the oil systems. So uh, we were only allotted five minute showers and five minutes is not enough to get off eight hours worth of oil all over your body. So I feel bad for the people who had to share a rack with me because um, there's nothing I could do to get all that stuff off. Um, but I did get to do a lot of cool stuff. I got to go to uh, Singapore and Guam and Singapore is, is a, a fantastic place if you've never gotten a chance to visit. Guam is also cool, cool but it's very small. There's not a lot to do. Um, but uh, one of the things that you don't think about too often is uh, there's sort of a lack of communication on submarines. It's not, as far as I'm aware, it's not as common on surface boats nowadays. So um, surface boats nowadays, my understanding is that they have internet the whole time that they're out and about. Submarines, that's not the case. So it feels a little bit like stepping back in time. Uh, if you and a, a, if you have a question like, oh, I wonder who started like the president in Independence Day, who that is, uh, you just get to keep not knowing that until the next time you get to port. Uh, if you or nobody else knows, um, you know, you get, I, I get a little bit of emails every now and again, and they have a couple sets of eyes that would come on them. Um, but that lack of communication does have sort of downsides. Um, I know when I was out uh, on a six week underway, um, my stepdad who raised me from the time I was two, he was perfectly healthy. And then in the six weeks I was gone, he was diagnosed with cancer, went to hospice, mm -hmm. died, and then was buried about two days before that I came back up. Um, all of that really short period of time. And so, you know, being out with that lack of communication really can be a hindrance sometimes. Although sometimes it can save you from things. Um, I also did get a, I came back from another short underway, and I had a, I got a phone call from a friend from back home who called to congratulate me on my engagement um, the only problem was I wasn't engaged, at least not that I knew of. Um, 
it turns out somebody that I had been keeping in contact with sort of as a pin pal had started telling people that we were engaged in getting married as soon as they got out of the military. Um, that, that person, the person who called me was my wife, who's here with me tonight, <laughs> and she, uh, I think it might have been a ploy just to reconnect with me, but um, if so, it worked. If not, you know, I guess it's all in the past now. Um, as far as my time in reserves go, um, you know, one week in a month, two weeks a year, I don't have too much to say about that. Um, I did enjoy my time, but there's no nuclear component to the um, reserves, so I, they had to re-rate me, and they told me, you're going to be an areographer's mate, which is a weather person. Um, I didn't stay in the reserves long enough to become a forecaster, so I'm what they call a weather observer, so I can look outside and tell you what the weather is now. Um, oh. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, but the things that I got out of the Navy, I really got a sense of uh, purpose and a drive. Um, during my time in the engine room, I learned sort of a lot about the um, nuclear specific materials and the selection process that it goes through for that. And that is what led me to um, decide to pursue a degree in material science and engineering, which is why I'm here now. Um, it sort of gave me a lot, of, a lot more confidence. I used to... Um, you know, I guess dealing with all the sort of adversity that you deal with, being in the military, the long hours, the, um, um, you know, trying to deal with, you know, tough situations, fire, I, I got a chance to put out a fire, which is uh, fun in hindsight, scary at the time, um, you know, and then as far as dealing with like, the first time you dive and you see how much water comes into a submarine, which if you haven't seen that, you know, consider yourself lucky because it's, uh, it's a bit shocking the first time. Um, but all those sort of adverse, um, dealing with those adverse conditions really helped boost my confidence and um, sort of gave me a sense of determination. And so um, I'd like to thank you all for letting me speak today. Um, and that's what I have, I have to say. Maybe we should awesome. we should Thank check you. with your wife. Huh? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, <she> claims not. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our next speaker tonight will be Maria, and Maria is like me a chemistry person. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Chemist rule. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. So um, yeah, I uh, started out as a chemist chemistry undergrad and when I graduated I knew I didn't want to go into chemistry research and have to be begging for you know money all the time to get grants I said that's not what I want to do so I went out and worked at Allied Sigma Corporation knowing I wanted to go back to graduate school for um, material science and so that's like chemistry on the engineering side so as you all know so in doing that working at uh, Allied Sigma they would pay for my graduate degree. Okay, cool. So as I'm going back, in the old days we didn't go on the internet. Pull down little cards from the bulletin board, send them in, and you got material sent to you. So I get a call from a recruiter, Navy recruiter, nuclear power master chief. Kind of like a used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it sounded interesting. So I went down and talked to him. Took the test, he says, you want to go be a nuke? And I said, well, what, what do I do? Well, you can, this is in the 80s, you can go teach at nuclear power school. Nothing against teaching, but I can do that now when I go back to graduate school. So what, what's it to me? He says, well, they're starting to get women on ships now. You want to be on the ship? I said, that I would love to do. So I said, okay. And you get, get into the program, and it's exciting, right? So I get to put my hand up and take that oath, which every person in the military takes, right? Enlisted officer, the first part's all the same. I solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? And um, <clears throat> we do this, everyone. And so that makes a difference, because when I thought about, you know, teaching, can do that now. What's the difference doing in the Navy or outside the Navy? Is there a difference? And you take that oath, and that's what makes the difference. And the difference, if you want to know about the, uh, I mean, you've all read this preamble to the Constitution. What is it I'm 
swearing to support and defend, right? So the forefather, this is not just a bunch of rules saying, okay, you're gonna do this, this. They said, okay, this is preamble, and it tells me, right? In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. So that's what I swore an oath to. I didn't swear an oath to the president. I didn't swear an oath to any political party or whatever. I swore an oath to defend that, to defend the liberties, so did every other person in the military. And that was kind of special at the time, in the late 80s. Um, there were a lot of things going on where the uh, people were taking, making advances against tyranny and evil, right? And it had gone on back, you know, World War II, okay, we hear about all these things. Then all through these wars, and now, People are taking a position, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of these things taking place. So we get this oath and why we're doing it. Now we get to do all the fun Navy stuff, okay? We get to go on a ship, okay? I think I'm, I'm a direct assistant Navy engineering duty officer. I'm gonna do Navy, I'm gonna fix ships. I'm gonna do all this great stuff, but I get to go on a ship because if you can't fix them, all you're doing is fix them, you don't understand what the purpose of them. It's kind of like, Whenever my mother talks about people who design refrigerators, they never use them, or ovens, because these guys never <laughs> use them, okay? Or did you ever go try to fix a car these days? The engineers that design cars do not fix the cars. <laughs> okay. so, um, so we go off and do all this fun Navy stuff, and got to be on a ship. And you get to go, and it's a great adventure. You know, the old advertisement, it's not just a job. It's an adventure. And you go and you do all these things. You go overseas. You interact with people from so many countries. And, and here you are, just a little nobody, right? And the, every time you go out on liberty, what are you told? You're a representative of the United States, and you can't bring you know, anything bad against you. You are represented. So that's a, that's a big burden. And I know we tell all the folks that, and, you know, and everybody's got their stories of their port calls and what happens, and and they're all true. All the all the Navy stories you hear are true. Maybe embellished, but they're true. And you get to do all these great and fun things. So, but sometimes, you know, when you're out on the ship, when you're out fighting out in the, the what do we call it, the pointy tip of the spear. All right, that's all great. But a lot of times, you're back, you're the muscle power behind it. So as an engineer, I also got to go fix the ships in the shipyards. Shipyards are not places where sailors need to be. They need to be out at sea doing their jobs. In the shipyard, it's very discouraging and demoralizing. And what I had to remind them was, yeah, you and that guy from Renner Refueling on an aircraft carrier, right? Northrop Grumman guy and you are doing the exact same job. You go to the bar, you have your Carl Vincent ball cap on. And somebody says, gee, thank you for your service. Can I buy you beer? All right, I get a free beer. But what's the difference? Why didn't they say that thing to that Newport News guy? He's a real talented guy. He's serving his country. He's, he's proud of what he does and he's good at what he does. And yet they're thanking you. And it goes back to that oath that we took it off with that we swore to uphold. And that's what makes it special. That's what's the bond between people who've been in the military. That you took that oath and, and you're gonna be there for your shipmates. You, it's kind of hard to understand if you haven't been in that situation what it means uh, to have that bond, to be there for people in all situations. And um, so, you know, uh, the <clears throat> so once once they've got that, that trying to remind them of their purpose, okay, and and to get that morale up because you can lose sight of it, you know, back in the when you're not really on the tip of the spear. When you're on the tip of the spear, you're not necessarily thinking about it either because what are you thinking of? Your shipmates. How can what's going on? 
how am I supporting them and they're supporting me? And really, in the real life, let's not be big about it, you make personalities, there's clashes, all this type of thing. But whatever it takes, you're going to get that job done. You're working together as a unit. And that's something that is amazing to be able to experience, okay? To be there together, to put that, com com it's not just camaraderie, it's more than family, it's more than anything you'll ever experience, all right? But the base of it is, it goes back to that, what we swore to do, okay? And every veteran you talk to, you know, will say, just doing my job. And that's true, it's, it's a small thing when you think about it. Because I'll give you two examples of people who did the ultimate thing. Uh, when I reported to a, the aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf, they were a memorial service that day. The two Marines went crashed and they recovered their bodies in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Okay? So that day, that ship bonded together. And I didn't know those people. They were my shipmates because we were all in the same thing, but I never knew them, and yet we bonded to, to, for that occasion. Another uh, example of the sacrifice that people make are the families. <coughs> Just heard of Josh's. But I, know, I remember one time when my son was five months old, I got a call from the XO of a squadron, a Marine had crashed into the deck of Kennedy. And I had to go get the act together to go in and make the, the, the inform the relatives. Now, Marines do not um, notify after 10 p.m. So all night long, I had to hold this. In the morning, woke, and, you know, fed my son and go, and that is the worst day of my naval career. But I can tell you it was nothing compared to the sacrifice that that mother made. So um, when you think about that, whenever you say to a veteran, thank you for your service, and they say, it was just doing my job. It, because we know the ultimate sacrifice was made by the families and the members that we never made, and whatever we did pales compared to that. Okay, you could, and we get to do some really great, cool things. I mean, I've been all over the world, uh, in the Philippines, during Mount Pinatubo, uh, through the Suez Canal, Singapore, uh, all over the Med, you know, Bahrain, Dubai, all these great places seen a lot of great, met a lot of great people in the Philippines, wonderful. And yet, none of that compares. And so when somebody says thank you, and you're like, you feel humbled. And for my, on my aspect of it, I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to, to be a part of something that's bigger than myself, and it's something that's really worth making that sacrifice for. And so, I think Veterans Day, truthfully, it's not really for veterans. It is, but veterans know that they did, and they don't need all the, the big thing. But what it is is for everybody to recognize there's things in this nation that are worth making that sacrifice for. Okay? And so I challenge you, whenever you thank them, to challenge yourself. Am I upholding? those principles of liberty and freedom in this country because it was worth it. You know? and, and we have great opportunities to do that. So I um, thank you. And uh, if you want some sea stories, there's plenty of them out there. <laughs> Fun times in all kinds of places. Thank you. So, I really right. appreciate it. So next we will have um, Joseph Henrietti. Joe was a, is a World War II veteran. He was a um, tail gunner on a B-24 in the Second World War. In the um, 780, 789th Squadron of the um, 467th Bomber Group of the 8th Air Force. And do you, do you want the um, document camera? I do. You, do you want the document camera so you can show stuff? I'll, I'll show them after a little speech. Let's put it that way. Okay. Cool. It'll pertain to my service in the 
Air Force. I don't know where you dug up all that thing, but I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 97 years old, and uh, how much time do I have? As much as you want, as much as you need. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, get back to when I, I was in World War II. At 18 years old, then you had to sign up for the draft. The men did, the boys, we were still boys. <laughs> so in 1940, I signed up for the draft. But in Cayman High School, we had two classes, two graduating classes, a January one and a June. January would get together with June and we'd have our, whatever we had for the graduating class. But in the senior year, a young lieutenant pilot came up to our uh, assembly during noon time. No, after noon time, we'd have an assembly in the assembly hall. And he was a pilot. He graduated a couple years prior to me. And while he was home on a furlough, he was supposed to recruit pilots, people that were in the senior class. Oh, he looked pretty sharp up there, and silver wings. And so five of us volunteered. This one just, the only one passed, because we had to come down to tech here to take an exam. Anyway, from there on, after I passed, the test at Tech here. I was still going to school and then I uh, wasn't in the service but they had, they wanted me to take more tests and they shipped me down to Truex Field in Madison, Wisconsin. They'd supply me with a, the tickets on a Greyhound bus from Calumet down to Madison I'd stay there and take more tests, come back on the Sunday evening Greyhound bus back to Calumet, get up to Calumet to high school and go to school on the Monday morning. So that was all going pretty good. So January comes, I graduated, still going down to Truex Field on the weekends and pretty soon the head one of the draft board in Mohawk got a hold of me and he said what are you doing I said what do you mean he said you're listing in the Air Force Army Air Force now I said yeah he said oh no no he said you're going to be drafted because if we take somebody else out if we leave you go it we won't get credit for you <laughs> I said, well, I don't know what that. But anyway a couple days or a couple of weeks after that to get the letter that you and a few others from Mohawk to Keweenaw and will be sending you down to Marquette for your physical. You'd either be 4F, which you were out, or 1A. So this day we goes down there and we're all supposed to come back home. So we goes down to Marquette, got through the physical, I was in class A, so that's ready to go, and I was thought I thought I would be going into the army. And I'd rather fly than walk in the mud. <laughs> anyway, I got to class A after the physical, and I was told to go down to the next desk, and I went down there, and there was a sergeant there. He said, Henrietti, yep. He said, you're uh, going to Shepherdfield, Texas. I said, I am. He said, you're going to be in the Air Force. Wow. Well, I said, when am I going down there? Oh, he said, you're going to leave <coughs> on the train from Marquette right down to Shepherdfield, Texas. Huh. I said, oh no, we're all going home. <laughs> he got out of his chair. He's pretty big. <laughs> Sunny. Yet, no out of your vocabulary right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to Shepherdfield, Texas. 
I said, yes, sir. Oh, you learn quick. <laughs> <laughs> My mother and dad, they figure I'm going back home like everybody else. I said, cool. Now, communications, telephones, and that weren't too great at that time. I said, well, who's going to notice me? notify my parents that I'm not going back home tonight. He said, we'll take care of that. I said, how am I going to get to Texas? He said, you're going to be issued uh, tickets to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. That was with the Army, close to Chicago, and we'll give you enough money for lunch and stuff what you need on the train which would only be overnight. Anyway, I ended up there at Fort Sheridan. They issued me more tickets to go to Shepherdsville, Texas. Now I had 18 years old, you didn't get around the world like you do now. I hadn't been further than Madison, Wisconsin, Shepherd's Field. But it was a great experience for me. A uh, little boy from Mohawk, 18 years old and I got down into Chicago with the big terminals there. From there my next stop after they gave me tickets for Shepherd Field, Texas, I was going to Chicago to St. Louis to catch the train there down to Texas, which I did. Around that time it was pretty cool up here. Well prior to when the Sergeant said I was going to Texas. I said, I only got $5 in my wallet, which was a lot at that time. You kept it in your wallet, not in your pants pocket. And uh, he said, no, you're going to be taken care of, which they did. So I got down to Texas. I was going into pilot training. And I was going to be, you had a choice of, of a pursuit pilot or a bomber pilot. And I took the bomber pilots out and then you had to say why you're taking these. I figured after I got out of service I'd be able to fly people around in a big plane. <laughs> anyway, did pretty good there and all of a sudden we get in the morning class they said no if any of you did not have at least two years of college you'd better drop out now. And some of you with two years of college, you're gonna you're not gonna pass these courses. We didn't know it at the time, but the B-24 was kind of a rough bomber. And when they got into the the 29, that's the one that dropped the big one, they were pressurized and more sophisticated to fly. And you had to be a little bit older, a little bit sharper to fly them. Anyway, they said they would give us give me a, uh, a good job. I was going to be an airport tower manager. So there again, I get more tickets, some money. Went to Scottfield, Illinois. That's the river or uh, the air base across from St. Louis. Was there for quite a while. And the first thing you had to know there was the Morse code dot 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 dash dash dashes that's the Morse code and I got pretty good at it you had to know the Morse code you had earphones on the uh, typewriter was all in case letters you didn't have to shift and uh, got through that pretty good you had to be able to take the message over your earphones talk to a person, type it out, and it was like a third sense. And I was pretty good at that, but pretty soon I'd get called into the headquarters. Uh, they want to know if you still want to fly. Uh, what's up? They need tail gunners on B-24s. Cool. I said, yeah, I think I would. I will. More. Now they didn't monkey around for a week or that the next day you were on your way. <laughs> more tickets, <laughs> more money. To Scottfield or to Tyndallfield, Florida. 
and Scott Field. Now that's from Tim Lofia, Florida, up on the top of Florida. But anyway, went there and got to be a tail gunner. Got to be a tail gunner, and then we had a delay in route. Once I got my wings, once you got your wings, you were paid half your base pay to fly. Hazardous flying, they called it. But I think the infantrymen had it worse than me. Anyway, delay in route from Florida. I'm still 18, you know. From Florida to California. California. More money. Do, all, do what you want, but you better get from Tyndallfield, Florida, over to California at a certain date. But sure enough, Michigan is between. <laughs> so I figured, oh, I can make a few days off at home. Brought my orders to the train master in Canyon. I said, boy, can you help me? What's up? I said, I got to be at this base in California at this date. I said, can you set me up with the tickets? Long story short, you did. And I went to California. Went to California, and that's where the crews would be made. Tail gunners, bombardiers, pilots. There were always two pilots, pilot and co-pilot. Navigator. And we met in California. Now, as we were making up the crew, there was one old... Well, we used to call him the old buck. He was 10 years older than me. But he knew more about flying the plane, the B-24, than anybody else, any of the other pilots, which were just a couple years older than me. And uh, his leather jacket was kind of scarred up out of the shiny and, you know, new leather smells. Anyway, uh, we found out that he was a much better pilot than ours. But long story short, when we'd practice in California, we'd practice bombing the Golden Gate Bridge, a Rose Bowl, Hoover Dam, and there was a couple more. But you bombardier would just bomb with a camera, and he'd be scored on that. We'd have fighter planes coming in at the plane and instead of the guns being in the turret, the guns were there, but they mounted cameras. So we'd be shooting film and getting scored on that. Well, about the, th the third or fourth, I forget what mission we were coming back on, they told the pilot to start how much fuel. First they asked, the engineer gave me the fuel. Start, touch, and go landings. You come in. You land, put your throttles forward, and you touch and go. They said there's a crosswind, but others are doing it. Okay, so start doing that. We made about the third one, third or fourth, I forget. But prior to that now, got to back up a little bit. In the tail, there was a pursuit plane that wanted more pictures from the tail shooting at a pursuit plane. That was ours, but he was on camera also shooting at us, and we shoot at him. And the pilot said he'd like to have more film shot on him. So the pilot says, asked how much our film was in a canister. And they brought me back more, and the doors on the turret were like this. They'd open and close, because the turret, the turret would move. And you had a control stick You'd move the turret, and up you'd, up and down would be the guns. Anyway, long story short, we did that. Pretty soon the pilot said, we, we couldn't land in our turrets. We had to get out and get a speed, uh, the bomb, the ball turret, and I used to sit back in the waist, landing and taking off. But when I tried to get out of my turret, the doors were, I couldn't open them. And long story short, uh, the pilot was coming in, but he wasn't doing it too good. And before you know it, uh, we crashed. Mm -hmm. Now, 
with heavy gear in that, that turret, you didn't have much room. You had 250 calibers on each side, machine guns. So he didn't move around much, but in the crash, I didn't bounce around. We didn't have seat belts or that. Anyway, I could smell smoke, and I thought, oh boy. My mother didn't want me to fly. I said, huh, Mom was right again. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, pretty soon we landed where the runways crossed. So they had to get that plane out of the the runway so the other planes could come in and land. So as they were moving me, I started hollering and uh, nobody seemed to be doing anything. So we had two cranks that were supplements to the power that we get to run the tour. It was hydraulic and electric, but they gave us two cranks. One would turn the tour, the other would move the guns. So I took one of the cranks, they were pretty good and pretty heavy, and I started to SOS, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Somebody on the ground knew the Morse code. So they kept dragging me off, but then pretty soon on a, on a cable, because I was coming a little bit off the ground, still facing forward, not forward, backward. And pretty soon the guy comes up in the, my windshield and wow. So then they came, they thought everybody died on that plane. If we were sitting in a spot that I should have been sitting, there would have been 10 instead of nine. But I survived it because I rode the tour down. Now, I'm gonna cut out some things, but they took me, a captain had taken me, like my lawyer, into the brief, not the briefing, where they go over the, the cause of the crash. And uh, I didn't say much, didn't have much good to say about the pilot, but they didn't want to hear that. <laughs> but anyway, the pilot took me into the BOQ, their quarters base officer's quarters. And I said, now what's going to happen to me? I'm the last one on the crew. Prior to that, they took me to the hospital and I was good. He said, oh, another crew is going to pick you up. I said, yeah, another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said, you got to stay in, the, in my quarters here. But he said, somebody will come and pick you up. Guess who came and picked me up with three other officers? The old buck that knew how to fly, to fly, he was training. He would train pilots for four years. But there again, see the B-24 was getting phased out. We didn't know about it because the 29s were coming in. Big. That's why they didn't need to have B-24 pilots. Anyway, he asked what kind of a tail gunner I was. I said, well, how good I was. That's the question. How good of a tail gunner are you? I said, just as good as the rest, maybe better. He said, that's what we're looking for. So I got on his crew. His last name was Hap, H-A-P-P. -P. Before he got into the service, he was a uh, doctor in some damn thing in, in Iowa State Teachers College. So I went with that crew and uh, there again we used to we were stationed in Tonopah, Nevada and we'd bomb again with uh, cameras and we'd have to go to the different big places like we used to go to the other one to Golden Gate Bridge Hoover Dam, Rose Bowl, there were a couple others. And uh, so we got to be a crew, a good one. And before you know it, uh, we graduated. And then we went 
going to go to overseas. They had decided some would go to the Pacific, some would go to the Atlantic, Europe. We got put in the 8th Air Force in Europe. Station, all the 8th Air Force was in England. Smaller bases, so if the Germans came in to bomb a base, they wouldn't get a big one and put that one over. They could put out a small one, and uh, my base was at Ratkeith, England. So we did our bombing over England, and uh, our first plane was called Angel. And I got pictures of it in there. I'll show you the things there I got. And uh, we bombed, we ended the war in Europe. Now prior to that, we're getting pretty close. The Germans were fighting on one side, on the lower, on the south end, the Russians were, they were fighting on the north end. Now, on, the, on a few of our last missions, we were given uh, oil cloth flags of the United States. We had to wear them on the outside of our clothing. And we had a card. The Russians weren't too good to us. In fact, that was the beginning of the Cold War. All of you know about the Cold War? So we had to put that on because they said if we gave ourselves up, if we got shot down and gave ourselves up to the Russians, nine times out of ten they would shoot us. They would say we were Germans and American flyers. So they told us to give ourselves up to the Germans. Patton will get you up. That we're getting close to the end of the war. That's why they were so close. So anyway, the war ended, and we were ordered, which I have in here, to take our plane home on a certain date, June 9th, 1945, my 20th birthday. That's right in there. That's for the whole crew. And we'd fly back one plane at a time. The pilot and the navigator, we leave our base at Ratkeith and we had to go to Wales. It was closer to get to the States. And we were given two routes that they had to pick out for the weather. One was up to the Azores, no, one was up to Iceland and then the Azores were a little bit lower. So they picked out the Azores, it's probably not the word that's not come out to it, but Azores Islands. Anyway, we went there and got, after about three or four stops for fuel, we ended up at Bradley Field, and there we had to go to customs. We had to put everything on the table almost as long as that. And we had a good, the Baltimore gunner had a good camera, 35 millimeter at that time. The film would come in little canisters. And we'd give him money to take pictures as we were wrong. And then we'd give him money to have them develop. So each one of the crew had a few pictures. But in customs, three quarters of them, if they were not developed, they would take them away from us. If they were developed, they'd go through the whole thing and pick this one up, pick this out, and throw it away. So we lost a lot of film. Anyway, now, from 30 days rest and recuperation, had time enough to go, plus the whole Air Force onto to a field in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, the war in Europe was over, but the one in the Pacific was still going on. The B-29 still, still needed a tail gunner. So I was going to the B-29 tail gunner school in Nevada. 
on the ground, taking lessons on the ground. Never flew in the B-29, which I did. But then the war ended. But they put our B-24 in mothball down in, where the heck was that? Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> And it'll last forever there, I guess. <laughs> not only that, then they put our crew, the crews, not just ours, the B-24 crews, we were putting mothballs also. We were given different jobs throughout the Air Force bases. But see, they still had a crew to fly that B-24 to Russia. They put it on the field that the 24 still had enough uh, how should I say, miles to fly to get into Russia. But in the meantime then, uh, they phased that out also, and I had to uh, enlist for five more years or take a discharge, and I had enough, I took a discharge. <laughs> but if I, if I can get my things out of my, could somebody get that bag and open that up? I'll show you a few things if you want to put it on the screen. Yeah, I'll see if I can make the screen. Pardon? I'll see if I can make the screen work. I, I no, need just need to turn the light. I might press button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Okay. Can you get my bag yeah. over here, please? I'm a saver. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is old. This stuff is old. Ask me and find where's the camera? Right here. So just where to? Take like right here. Oh, yeah. down there. Yep. Okay. Like that. That's me in England. We used to have uh, sheepskin flying suits. They were very cumbersome. But here is when they gave me my electric flying suit. The turrets weren't that big, so this here is my parachute that I'd have to if I. We had to bail up. I had to make sure that was pretty handy because we had our uh, the straps on, and there were two clips that you'd clip the parachute on. Now let's see what else we got here. Ooh, baby. I think there's more stuff. In there. Okay. This is the oil cloth that we'd have to attach to our arm outside. And this is a safety pin because there are different suits on, you would make sure it fit. Now, when we flew, we had 45 caliber pistols, shoulder holsters, and we weren't supposed to give ourselves up too easy. We were supposed to try to make it back to England. This is what's left of the Russian card, which we were not supposed to dig for. We had to memorize it. Can hmm. you read what it said? I'm just going to turn this on. Now they should be able to do it. All finished. So that's the card we had to. We didn't want to give ourselves up to the Russians. Now, uh, you, you would put it this way then. This is the orders now to when we left. Uh, Just like if you're reading. Okay. That's my name on the bottom here. 
and that's the crew. And we were take as many, we took our ground crew back with us. Some were pretty sick on the flight. And then we took extra ones that we could fit in the plane. And uh, we all came home. And up there, if you see my birthday, June 9th, 1945. That was a good birthday party. <laughs> now, am I, do I have this right? Yeah, it's got to be up the other way. Just like, just like if you're looking. Oh, yeah. Just like that. Yeah. That's our first plane. It was called Angel. Now, when they wanted to contact us, this was the last numbers of our serial number, the plane. There were quite a few numbers. But they take the last three, 057. Now, uh, it's me. Here. Pilot, co pilot, bombardier, navigator, engineer, top torque, nose torque, belly torque, me, radio operator. Still remember. <laughs> Now, here's another oddity. Uh, this is the number that we had three planes over there. A couple of them got in trouble that they couldn't fix too good. And we'd, uh, but that was the number of the plane we took back. Now, if you remember 057. I was uh, a golfer down at the Kiwana for uh, well, about a little over 40 years. But if any of you uh, golfed at the Kiwana, when you come around number five hole, you go by where the kitchen is attached to the lodge. And boy, they always had something come out of the hips. And my partner and I would always, well there's a lot of them, we'd park there, park our carts there and uh, go in for breakfast, lunch or whatever you wanted to do and then we'd come out and you'd have to fit yourself into the crews there or the golfers that were coming down. You couldn't just jump off when somebody just came off the five. You had to wait long enough to get a clear plate. So as we're sitting there, this gentleman came by and uh, my partner's wife was the uh, business leader in the, in the lodge and he said, boy, they, they were uh, very good to us. They found us two rooms, him and his wife, and he said, boy, we had a, a better uh, how should I say? Coming when you go for looking for a word. <laughs> Summer vacation. Pardon? Vacation. Vacation. There you go. Anyway, he said, uh, "Oh, much better than England." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh, I was in England too." He said, "You were." I says, yeah. I said, what did you do? I said, the government sent me. He was going to be 24. Oh, he says. So if you can read this, I don't know if you can read it or not, but this, this book came through the mail to Grace Oaten, and she was the one that had one in the, the, uh, office at the lodge. Can you read this, what it says? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I'll read it to you. Uh, to Joe and the Kiwana Peninsula, in appreciation for your service to our country, I hope you enjoy it. Best wishes. And in his, his uh, name. And this was a Limber. He found this book. And he says, 
be sending this book to you, Grace in the Wintertime, and I hope you get it to Joe. And uh, now this I got to get over to here. Can you see this plane landing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> see the number on it? Can you read the bottom? Angel? That's our plane. Never knew it was going to be in a book like this. <laughs> and because there's a lot of a lot of planes. It was all about the 24, B-24. You have to remember the, the B-2 dozen, 24. So um, that's about all I have. <laughs> our map that we would carry. It's a silk map of Germany, France, and I don't like to open up because it's as old as I am. But this is one of the things they'd give us to trying to get back to our base. Now when you get off, when you bail out, which I never did, <laughs> practice 500 foot towers, but never bailed out of a plane. And uh, so guess what? They gave us this big compass. <laughs> 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 because when you bail out a plane, you know, you're twisting around, you don't know it's north, east, south, or west. <laughs> so they gave us this one. Now prior to that, we used, when we were little, well, little kids, we used to get them in, in uh, cracker jack box. <laughs> But it works. Like a lot of never had to use it. <laughs> you were on a submarine? Yes, I was. Do they have an intercom like with the hose? Um, not that I know of. Two years ago they did. I think they used to call that it was a malfunction if they had no, they'd call on to the to the mechanic room or something then. Anyway, we probably we shouldn't say that with the girls. Right? We would call it a voice tube. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> we did have a, uh, a mechanical voice tube. You what? We, had a we called it a voice tube. Lifted a lid up and yelled on it. And somebody on the other end stuck your ear to it. Yeah. No. After the war, we took our ground crew and uh, some of the crew that wanted to go back to see what how we bombed. Well, we had two ladies in the back where the ball tort and I used to be, we used to call that our office. Because you had the bomb bay in between where the catwalk you could walk through. But anyway, we had two, uh, they had more strips than we did, me and Birch. And pretty soon, they're looking around Back in the waist, they find this tube. He rolled his eyes. <laughs> now our tube was heated. Very, very cold, so you didn't take your dingus out or you'd freeze up in a hurry. <laughs> so we, it was heated. Girl, I hope I don't embarrass you. <laughs> we had to, it was like a cow's <laughs> and you'd have to put that in your pants and you would heat it so it would go up the plane. So we used to treat girls pretty good years ago, and now they're getting kind of with us. Anyway, <laughs> this one girl sees this P2 on the side of the plane, and oh, what's this? Well, I didn't want to say we peed in it. <laughs> I said, oh, it's nothing. She said, it got to be something to be in here. <laughs> <laughs> so the other girl, she's another one too. She had more stripes. Said, Whoa, what you got there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We won't tell me. <laughs> oh, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's probably hooked up with the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so that tube was kind of long. <laughs> I could put it back. <laughs> no. And the other one said, no, I exposed to the pilot. Oh. How do you work it? What part of the plane is this? She asked me. I said, it's the waist. Okay. <laughs> There's the particle. <laughs> so the other gravel jury says, your, prob your voice probably don't carry as good as mine. <laughs> she gets on it too. <laughs> oh, you're right, just spell it. Put your eyes close to your mouth. <laughs> Like toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Put it back. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> after it's all over, we land and we get off the plane. The pilot says, oh, we had to wait for a truck to take us to our quarters. And uh, anybody has questions? <laughs> We were trying to get a hold of you on the emergency intercom. <laughs> well, the crew knows what the hell that is. <laughs> <laughs> Pilot knew what it was. He looks at me. I told Birch, I said, I think he's going to be mad. <laughs> I'm going to ride back with the other crew. <laughs> Henry, Eddie, get back there. <laughs> That's before the the girls said about the intercom. So then they rode on a different truck, and he says, "Oh, Henry and Birch, you're the only two to get me into trouble." Now that's the colonel's oh. office girls. <laughs> <laughs> when they get back and tell them that they were trying to get a hold of this officer. <laughs> he said, oh, so we're all in the back of the truck, so he pounded on, on the roof of the truck. The driver said, what's up? Headquarters, please. He's going in the headquarters with me and Birch. I said, Birch and I have nothing to do with it. Because when this is all going through, Birch knows what the hell he's going, going on, and he's looking out the window. <laughs> and he's laughing, the joke on his face. And she says, what's the matter with your partner? <laughs> oh, I think he got the dry heaves. Dry heaves? <laughs> oh, I'm kind of crazy too. What's going to happen if he throws up? Well, he's going to clean it up squeaky clean. <laughs> what's going to happen if I throw up? You can bet your little A-double-S-S this pipe not going to clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the story for the day. So. <laughs> 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 Hope I didn't embarrass you folks. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll be up next, Walter. Did you say you have a, a thumb right. drive? Okay. That's going to be a hard uh, act to follow. Easy. <laughs> 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 Yark, I'm, I'm going to need your password for this. Yeah. Could use mine or something. Okay. I know. I was looking for a thumb drive. Yeah. Spot. I think I think I need a professional to help me with this. Mm -hmm. So while we're working with um, technology, I would like to introduce Walter Case. Is it Case or Case? Casey? Casey. 
Um, he is he was a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force for 27 years, and he is currently a graduate student in MTU's own College of Computing in Health Informatics. Health Informatics. That's true. My dad. Oh, thank you. Yep, he found it. So, Joe, my dad was a veteran in World War II. Pardon? My dad was a veteran in World War II. I didn't get what he was. He was a veteran in World War II. Okay. If he was alive today, he'd be 105. <laughs> now, there's another thing. There was a B-24 and a B-29 came into KI Sarrier about a month ago. And it was in the paper and all that. And my daughter lives in Marquette. So she goes and sees this plane and talks to the crew that flew that into Marquette. And she said, oh, my dad flew tail gunner in one of these. He did? <laughs> How long did he die? No, he's still living. He's still living? Can you get him here to the base? She said, well, I offered to come up and pick him up. But he's not too thrilled about that plane because it wasn't like our real 24. Anyway, he said, boy, can you get him up there? So anyway, with the, a friend of mine and her, and she got together with him, that, that crew would like to have me go through that plane with them. And my friend said he'd pick me up at 10 o'clock, so I live in Mohawk, you know where I live, there's one road here by the post office, 4th Street is here, so he's going to come at 10 o'clock to pick me up. Now, as I'm waiting for, like, if I waited for you guys, a deputy's car goes this way. Ooh. Pretty soon another one goes this way. So my friend comes in at 10 o'clock, he says, we got to get going. I said, oh, somebody's in trouble back here. What do you mean? I said, sheriff's car went both, two of them come in here, back there. And I couldn't see back there. And he said, no, we got to get going. So we came out of the house, two deputy cars there, sheriff was in one. And I said, who, somebody have a wreck? No, we're going to escort you <laughs> to K.I. Sawyer. I said, oh hell, I've been in Marquette many, many, many times, so I sure don't need an escort. The sheriff said, well, that's our orders to take you down there. Anyway, he said, the deputy will escort you down there. So the deputy left. No, the, the sheriff left. The deputy got left there, and on the side, I said, now, deputy, when we get out of Mohawk, don't escort us anymore. Just pull off and say you went to Marquette. Oh, boy, you know. <laughs> but he said no, and he took us down there, and you think the president landed at K.I. Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Here I'm in the, my friend's SUV, the deputy car's there, they has the, the, my driver is Mr. Henry Aiden with you. Yes, okay, we'll open up the gates. <laughs> We're going to escort you to the plane. Now there's a long line of people waiting to get in that plane, and here's this old boy comes out and goes in the plane, and I was the only one from World War II that was in that plane that flew in one of them. Mm -hmm, sure, of all funny. their going around, so that was, that's another stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I took up time for me. Oh, that's <laughs> very kind of you. So well, consider it. Well. Um, I got the email from Kathy Pitnar about this meeting, and I share everything that Maria said about uh, being in the service and why you do it and some of the experiences. Um, people often say to me, thanks for your service. Um, I think I felt similar to Maria. I, I never felt like I did a service. It was a great experience that I enjoyed. And I was part of something that was bigger than myself. Uh, she talks about her shipmates. Um, the Air Force, we don't have ships, or not too many anyway. And, uh, but you have a sense of your unit mates, the people that are in the unit with you, 
and a shared mission. And uh, my life is pretty much captured by these statements. Truth is uh, stranger than fiction. That is, that's been my life. I'd rather be lucky than smart. The problem with predictions is the future. Uh, don't expect life to be fair, and it might not be about you. And all those things came true. So I went to a high school, a military school in high school, called Culver in Indiana. And like you often hear, I got sent there because I wasn't a normal teenager. But rather than a cut-up, I wasn't doing anything. And the military school did fine, it got me going. And then I graduated from Ohio State with a Bachelor of Science in 1976. I'm a medical doctor from the University of Toledo in 1981, and I went to uh, Harvard for a master's in public health that the uh, Air Force paid for because they had uh, a special role that I was going to fill. I did several medical residencies and fellowships, and now I'm here at MTU. And I'll kind of explain how this very thing happened. That's me, about 1954, with my first pet, dog named Pal, in the suburb of Cleveland. That's the way the United States used to look, that I remember. And uh, everyone on that street was a World War II veteran. Pretty much everyone. Every one of my father's friends, all the family had served one way or another during that uh, conflict. Now, uh, a lot of people in the United States have no experience with what the military was like. Well, how did I end up here in the Upper Peninsula? Uh, that's me, I'm 18 there, and I'm going to work on that Great Lakes boat. And when I worked on those, that was, uh, when I worked on those boats, that's, that was Lorraine, Ohio, um, I came up to Duluth and Marquette. And I came to Marquette a lot because we used to uh, come up to get a load of iron ore and we'd load half a load either in Superior, Wisconsin or Duluth and we'd pick up the other half in Marquette and then head back down south. So I knew how pretty it was up here and how beautiful it was. And then all of a sudden, towards the end of my life, I had the opportunity to come up here and live. Oh, and that's a, that's a picture of me working on light freighters. I'm probably the last living coal passer you're going to see, <laughs> unless you did that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's uh, me in the fire hold of a steamboat on the lakes, and you can see the shovel in my hand. Uh, we didn't actually have to fire the boilers. They ran with stokers. We had to clean the ashes out, and sometimes the stokers would break. And then we'd end up, as they called it, hand bombing it. And this is when I graduated from medical school with my lovely wife in 1981. She's still with me 42 years later. AT6. What's that? AT6. That's a T34. T34. So, to, when I worked in the lake freighters, that's how I got the money to go to school for undergraduate. But to go to medical school, I had a scholarship, and I had to pay the government back by working in the Indian Health Service. And this is uh, in Arizona about 70, 80 miles west of uh, Tucson. And I know the Air Force Base there, Davis Bonthan, very well. And they had an aero club there. And even though I was in the public health service, I was considered a commissioned officer. And so I was able to go on the base, we chopped the commissary, and I joined the aero club. And so this would have been 1982 time frame. 
and all the other guys in the Aero Club were old F-4 uh, pilots from Vietnam. And they taught me how to fly and they were great instructors. And that's my wife and my two sons. And they said to me, hey, uh, you really like flying and you speak pretty good English. You ought to be a flight surgeon. <laughs> Most of the medical staff at the hospital, David Spots, said were not US citizens. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good idea, and I decided I would uh, pursue that career. So I joined the Air Force, did all the training, and that's when I graduated from the Aerospace Medicine Primary Course in 1988. Uh, that's the number of the course. We didn't graduate to September, uh, but they, they kept track of the courses by the start date. And I was very excited about that. And when that picture was taken, it must have been the graduation because I had the flight surgeon wings on. <laughs> so why does the Air Force have flight surgeons? Joe, did you have a flight surgeon with your unit? In, in, in the ground, yes. On the ground we did, yes. So like if you got sick, you went to the flight surgeon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So We called it something different. Instead of a hospital, it was a different so the reason they had flight surgeons, as Joe mentioned about the accident that he was in in the training, uh, the casualty rate in World War II for training was high. And uh, in uh, Tucson and in San Antonio, I met folks that uh, were trained in, uh, to fly pursuit aircraft in World War II, and they would tell me that they they crash an airplane a day during the training training part, and getting, getting through training alive was just about as rough as getting to the combat zone. And a lot of the accidents were related to medical problems. So the Air Force decided to have uh, that they would screen people aggressively to prevent coordination, neurologic problems, vision problems, and. Uh, make sure that the air crew stayed uh, healthy. Um, air crew are expensive. Um, figure an F-15, mission ready F-15 pilot, probably costs about somewhere between five and $10 million to train. So once you get them trained, you don't want to lose them. And then when you need them, there's never enough of them. So why? Uh, entered the Air Force and went uh, through flight school or to the flight surgeon's course. I uh, ended up as a flight surgeon and I was supporting the uh, triple nickel. And this is the actually the squadron commander's plane of the triple nickel. You can see the green stripe up there at the top with the stars on it. And this is a strike of an F-15A. It's a uh, two uh, crewed aircraft, uh, primarily uh, its mission was air to ground support, but it could also do air to air. And I flew in that, and I actually flew in that aircraft. And as Joe's plane was uh, 057, this one is 187. And this was a serial number they kept track of their aircraft. This was an Air, air Force aircraft. Congress <coughs> approved its purchase in 1987. And it was 187th plane bought by the Air Force that year. That's how they numbered them. And I had a, a great time. I, at Luke Air Force Base, I had a lot of great medical cases. And I flew about uh, 200 hours uh, in the Eagle and in the F-16. At that time, the Cold War was winding down. And the two major training bases for fighter pilots in the Air Force was Luke and another one down in Florida. I can't think of the name of it right now. And uh, we had about 150 to 200 fighter aircraft on the base, evenly split between F-15s and F-16s. And they had a lot of back seats that I could fly in, which was great. And that was a, a great experience. And while I was at uh, Luke Air Force Base, 
one morning I went out to get the newspaper, I think it was a Sunday morning, and I picked up the newspaper and it said, Iraq invades Kuwait. Hmm. I said, oh my God, things are going to be different. Hmm. And they were. So I ended up going over to UAE, and this is one of the little deployed hooches we uh, lived in. We were all having a drink and playing some cards there. This would have been about 1980, 1990, 1991 time frame. Oops. Something, I must have got the slides out of, out of line or goofed up. But when we were at a base called Minhad, and actually after the worst part of the war was over, we had an F-16 accident. We had F-16s in Minhad, and uh, thank heavens the pilot was okay. It was a maintenance problem. It was a training sortie, and he had a maintenance problem. He had to eject, and he was fine. And this is what the crashes look like after they happen. Those aircraft look so big and solid when you sit at them, but when they hit the ground, there's not a lot left. And as, as flight surgeons, you were involved in the uh, mishap investigations. Uh, that aircraft was probably a $25 million uh, piece of hardware, so they don't like to lose them when they, they don't need to. And here we are out at the crash site taking pictures and walking around and looking, and that desert was very sparse out there. Has anyone got any idea what this is? Machine gun. It's a it's a 20 millimeter cannon. It's the cannon on the on the F-16, and it's a Gatling gun like thing, and it rotates. And uh, since it was so solid, it survived the accident pretty well. <laughs> the crash. And then I went on to Harvard, and this is when I graduated. It's my son Tom. And I went to a training program in San Antonio for two years and learned a bunch of things. And then I left there and I went to Misawa Air Base in the northern tip of Japan. And you can see the cherry blossoms there and there's a big naval uh, presence on there too. They had the old um, uh, patrol boats, not patrol boats, patrol aircraft that they used for anti-submarine warfare Turboprop uh, P3, I think it was called. Yeah, they were based out of there. It was a pretty base. They got a lot of snow up there, just like here. They'd average about 100 inches of snow a year. And this was the aircraft we flew. I flew, in, uh, I flew about 100 hours while I was there. This is a F-16. It's a Block 50. And their spe specialty was the SEED mission, Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses, and they used this missile right here called the HARM-88, and they had this little targeting pot here. Have you kind of wondered, just out of curiosity, why the Russians don't own the airspace over Ukraine yet? I mean, they got a much bigger air force than the Ukrainians do. And yeah, some of their hardware is not too good, but you would have thought by now they would have overpowered the Ukrainian Air Force, right? They're still taking a fair amount of casualties in their Air Force. Well, it's because they don't have a mission. But the way they think in their doctrine, when the Air, U.S. Air Force thinks they have a, a, an engagement, they say we have to suppress the other Air Force, get them out of the sky, make the sky safe, and then we can operate. The Russians don't think that way. They just fly individual missions, strike a target, almost like artillery, and come back out. So they would never go after the Ukrainian Air Force. The Ukrainian Air Force was able to adapt, and now because the Russians have taken attrition, they're not doing as well. Well, that's, this was the same mission. What we would do is we would take out the uh, SAMs, the surface-to-air missiles, and You would, the old seed mission in the F-4 was a two-seat job, and the guy in back 
ran these receptors and picked up the radio emissions from the uh, radio emissions from the radars, and they would watch a missile similar to that to take out the anti uh, SAM site, the surface to air missiles. This was done by a computer, and one guy could handle it. And when the uh, surface to air missiles would know that, or the surface to air missile crews would know we were looking for them, so they would play this cat and mouse game and turning on their radar so they could see you, turn their radar off quick if they thought we were sending a missile in on them because the missile would home in on the radar. Well, they had built a uh, kind of an inertial guidance system along with this targeting pod that if they turned off the missile, the missile would remember where they were. And it would kind of sh short circuit that a little game. And what you see here, this is a, a flare that they would release uh, if you were an air-to-air -air engagement to uh, spoof or uh, to decoy a heat-seeking missile. And this is uh, the squadron that I flew with most, the Panthers, and uh, that was the Hazards that were there. And Eldridge was the uh, mascot for the Panthers. And uh, the the 13th Fighter Squadron had a history with Vietnam. And at this assignment, I learned about operational, uh, I was with an operational unit, learned what actually went on. On a, on a mission, a unit that was oriented towards a specific combat mission. After that, I left. After that assignment, it was about 1998. I went to San Antonio um, and was at the large medical center there. And I used to fly out at Randolph Air Force Base. And I would fly the Tweet, the T-38, or the T-6, the replacement for this jet. This jet, that jet was probably, gosh, I guess we can't see the tail number on that. But they were mostly purchased about 1960. Mm -hmm. and Joe, do you remember a German jet called the Messerschmitt 262? Correct. Jet. First jet. Well, those were kind Seen of it. fearsome things, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, they were fast compared to our P-51. Not yeah. only uh, that, when they came after us, they were in a dive, so they got that much more speed again. Yeah. The engine on this thing was essentially a Messerschmitt 262 engine. Right. <laughs> I always thought that was amazing. Yeah. So they, you know, the jet world was new. I mean, it's 19. This thing is, this thing is procured about 1955, ten years after World War II. There aren't jet airliners yet. The Air Force says we need a trainer. We want a little engine that's reliable, that doesn't use too much gas. So they <laughs> copy that one. That was amazing. While I was there, I participated in something that was probably very interesting and it had, uh, I think, a fair amount of importance. Medical care takes a lot of resources. So if you have a big field hospital behind a combat zone, you got all the medics that are taking care of people. You need a lot of water, you need medicine, you need food. Well, all that logistic support is preventing them from getting bullets to the front. So supporting the medics is never a happy thing for the line commanders. You guys, uh, you guys might remember that we invaded Panama about 1990 or so. So the old doctrine was, is we did set up big hospitals close to the combat zone. We have smaller hospitals up front. And that old movie show called MASH, that was one of the smaller hospitals. The front lines would move her back and the little hospital would move back and forth and they send everyone back to the, uh, to the major, major uh, facility, the large hospital. Well, when we invaded Panama, they didn't have time to do that. And we took casualties, but they didn't have any medics there to like stabilize them. 
So they just put them in the transport planes and flew them up to San Antonio. But they didn't really have any way to handle them. I was not there when that happened. I was at Luke Air Force Base, but I have friends who were in San Antonio with that ha when that happened, and they told me that about midnight on a Saturday, they got phone calls for anyone to return to the hospital. And then there was a uh, big, uh, Kelly Air Force Base had some big runways, and he, they said these transport planes just started to land, and they uh, opened up the planes, and they just had a bunch of casualties in there. And some of them were fairly serious, and they lost. Uh, several people expired on the trip up from, uh, from Panama to the, they landed in San Antonio. So this triggered one of my bosses, uh, General Carlton, thought that uh, we were going to get in combat situations where it was not going to be possible to bring these giant hospitals in, like in Panama, and yet we needed to get the injured people out. So they developed this concept called EMEDS and CCAT, and in the first Gulf War, an Air Force fighter wing had an air transportable hospital that required about three C-5s to bring the equipment in to set it up. The C-5s are those gigantic transport planes, and it was staffed with a couple hundred people, and it had a pretty big footprint. The c cut that down to 25 people and two pallets. So you didn't even need one C-5 to get it in and set it up. And it was set up to stabilize the people. And then these CCAT teams were called critical care in the air transport teams. They would consist of uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists, uh, critical care nurses, and stuff like that. And they would transport one patient and have like an intensive care unit. So the plan was rather than keep them in the combat zone until they got better, you stabilized them so they were able to be cared for in an intensive care unit. Plane would come in, pick them up and take them out. And in the last war, you may have, there was a lot of shows on TV about the CCAT units in Iraq. Any of you heard of that? If you were, uh, one of the reasons our death rate in the last war was so low was because of this casualty collection system. If you got a combat injury, the Army took you from the injury point to a, to a stabilizing hospital. They would get you stabilized and you'd fly out with a CCAT team to uh, Europe to Landstuhl in Germany and then from Landstuhl, you'd fly back to the United States. So in the Iraq War, if you suffered, suffered a serious casualty injury, you might be back in the United States three or four days after the injury. You might be in Europe 48 hours later. And that, it's a lot easier to take care of them in the United States than it is in the combat zone. And that's probably why our death rate was uh, lower than in other wars, and without that uh, technique of care reform, I think it would have been higher. So I was involved in the planning for that from the operational side, and it was a good thing for me to do, and I, I consider it was, uh, that it was, I was lucky to participate in it. So then when I left there, we're now about 2004, the picture is 2006. This is Kadena Air Base on Okinawa. And I went there to run the uh, aerospace medicine department at the hospital there. And that was one of my best assignments. And uh, had a lot of fun there. Uh, joined myself, did a good job. Uh, I think that, it, that was good. But after I had been there, what happens in the military today is what happened to me speak about myself personally, I became what was called a PACAF rat. PACAF stands for Pacific Air Forces. They have their headquarters 
in Hawaii on the base there. And while I was at Misawa, I made friends with a bunch of people my own rank. And I went off to do other things, and they went off and they advanced up the chain. And you kind of set these connections up so then when someone shows up in a commission of a uh, command position, he says, Oh God, I, I, I need a CE guy. And he remembers back from the Sao who his buddies were and said, Oh, get Joe. And so I got sucked into the Pac Aft Mafia and spent most of my career <laughs> in the Pacific, which means I kind of speak Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Because as they say, the Pacific is a Navy <laughs> lake, right? <laughs> so, this was, I was getting near the end of my career then, and they sent me to my next job, which was on Guam. You're right, there's not a lot to do on Guam. <laughs> this is looking at Anderson Air Force Base. You can see the runways, it's about 15.